Edward Wong, the diplomatic and international correspondent for the New York Times. He's uh, reports on foreign policy from Washington, D.C. right now. But he spent a lot of his career ab abroad, including 13 years in China and, and Iraq. Uh, he was the Beijing bureau chief, uh, the Times' largest overseas operation in China from 2008, which was an exciting year for Tibetan news, um, and, uh, up to 2017. Um, so, welcome. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Professor Tuttle. Mm -hmm. Appreciate being here. Uh, so, what I thought we would just start by having a conversation about some of what he's observed, uh, the place of Tibet. Uh, he, uh, the talk, as some of you know, was originally, originally scheduled for earlier, um, but we had to put it off for a couple of weeks because he was covering events in Hong Kong. So, um, the, the general theme of this series is reporting on Asia. And, and we can sort of bridge, you know, these frontiers of China from Tibet to Hong Kong as, as it seems relevant. But um, I want to, I mean, my, my biggest interest, I think, is just thinking about, um, as I've followed your reporting over the years, what the major changes are in, in the way that Tibet gets covered and how the Chinese state restrictions on travel and, and reporters in Tibet has impacted um, reporting there. Um, thanks. So the, uh, I think there are some, there's always some confusion among people who don't work in China about what's permitted and what's not permitted in terms of reporting on Tibetan regions in China. Um, for a long time now, many years, um, the Chinese government has not allowed foreign journalists to go into central Tibet, the part that we know is a Tibet autonomous region. Um, that includes Lhasa and, you know, the area that's historically called Yutang um, by the Tibetans. Um, it has generally been possible to travel to ethnic Tibetan regions outside of central Tibet, and that includes, um, it's the regions known as Kham and Amdo uh, in Tibetan and that are in Sichuan province and Qinghai province in China. And so when, during the years I was there from 2008 to end of 2016, um, generally a lot of my reporting on Tibetan issues centered around issues in those regions rather than central Tibet because it was very difficult to get to central Tibet. Um, you could only go to Lhasa and those areas if the government invited you on a formal trip that they would arrange for journalists. Um, and I went on one of those trips once, and we can talk more about that and what it's like to be on one of those. But in, um, in general, to really get at, try and get at some of the issues that you know, Tibetans were grappling with, we had to travel to parts of Sichuan and parts of Qinghai province, provinces. Um, the, there, when you go to those areas, uh, you don't have to tell the local authorities whether you're going or not. Um, there's no rule like that in place. China did have a rule, a general rule like that for reporters traveling outside of Beijing before 2008, but they officially got rid of that rule in 2008. And even before then, uh, foreign reports generally didn't really follow that rule. Like they would still just go off to regions and report on them without notifying the local authorities in those regions. Um, but, you know, when you go to these Tibetan areas, it, they are very sensitive areas. The local officials and the local um, police don't want foreign reporters in those areas. They, um, if they find Westerners there reporting, then they'll often try and stop them and then, um, and then might try and deport them from those areas. So in recent years, when I talked with colleagues in China, um, there's been a, they say that that's gotten more strict and it's harder to enter these areas and do and spend you know a day or longer in the areas and do real interviews um, and then be able to come back and write a report it's oftentimes police would try and, and track down the westerners um, very quickly and then try and hold them in police offices and question them and then try and dissuade them from staying in the area do you think that it's uh, the local officials just have this sense that it's going to cause them trouble or this is kind of a directive nationally that they they know that that's part of their job or some combination of the two i think it's probably a combination too i think that from you know i'm sure that 
uh, authorities in Beijing have put out um, orders saying limit, restrict any reporting on these areas. And I think that's especially true post-2008, after the uprising uh, across many parts of the Tibetan Plateau. Um, and I think that also local officials, and this is true of almost everywhere I've been to in China, local officials are very unhappy when journalists show up. And, and it's not even just Western journalists. It can also be even Chinese journalists right. or even Xinhua journalists. They don't, they don't like them because all these journalists, whether they're writing internal reports for party consumption or external reports, you know, for a Chinese reading audience or for an English reading audience, they don't, local officials think that these reports will expose, like, bad policies that they're implementing or their failure to implement policy. So they're, they have orders to, um, you know, the police in these places have orders to try and prevent reporters from from being there. But do they kick out Xinhua reporters in the same way that they kick out Western? No, they don't. I mean, as far as I know, I haven't heard that, but I do know that there exists an uneasy relationship often right. between Xinhua reporters and local officials. Like there's this system in China called the Neitan, the internal reference and internal reports, and Xinhua reporters will write these for um, that are then circulated among party officials in, in Beijing. So um, in terms of kind of limiting, I mean, I guess my question is the success rate of, of catching, I guess, the reporters and, and, and excluding them, does that, has that affected over the time that you were there, for instance, or since that time, does it, do you feel like it's affected the kind of stories that people are willing to write or are just able to write? I think it's gone in waves. I think 2008, like, so, for example, in 2008, I got there right after the uprising. So I heard some tales about of how reporters tried to do reporting on it. And then, um, and so 2008, uh, people tried to get in, but were, they were prevented from going into these towns where a lot of the protests took place. And then when the wave of self-immolation started a couple years later, a lot of, especially in the area of Nawa, which was the center of that. A lot of reports tried to go in there and they found it very difficult. Like there were many roadblocks in the area. You sometimes police would stop reporters at the nearby airports. They would fly into area, areas in like Gansu province and try and drive there and it was very difficult. So um, when there are these upticks in sort of protest activities, then the police clamp down more. Other times they seem to loosen up and you can go in there um, without having to take extreme deceptive measures to get in and do reporting. So, for example, my, the last time I was in Tibetan region was at the end of 2016. It was one of my last trips before I returned to the U.S. And I drove around for two weeks in the Kham area in Sichuan, in like western Sichuan province, and had no problem. Like, I never encountered a police officer. Um, I stayed at different hotels. I managed to go into Larungar, which was a monastery where officials were dismantling parts of the monastery and trying to bring down the population of monks there and try and try and evict thousands of monks from that area. And I managed to go in there and spend a full day in there speaking with people, pretending pretending I was a Chinese tourist. And um, and so I think that it's gone in waves. Like sometimes you can do those reports. Now, um, I think one of the things we had talked about was that in the last three years or so, there have been very few reports from Tibetan regions. And, and there's a question of why that is. I do think that um, it's a combination of factors. I think for some reporters, they th they've heard stories of previous stories of people being detained and then kicked out. And they don't want to invest the time and the money into trying to make one of these trips and then having nothing to show for it because they're detained. So I think that the more you hear about uh, this happening, the more put off you are by trying to attempt one of these. I know that this is a big thing that um, happened with Xinjiang reporting around 2014, 2015, because the authorities in Xinjiang, which is another very sensitive ethnic minority area, they were really clamping down hard on Western reporters flying into the region. And so um, reporters became dissuaded by trying to get into these towns and do reporting. Um, I think in the last, a uh, year to two years, um, there's been another um, issue, and I've spoken with people in my bureau about this, which is that because there's been such a spotlight on trying to expose these internment camps in Xinjiang and because of the Hong Kong protests this year, mm -hmm. that there's been an overstretching of resources in 
China, Hmong reporters based in China. So a lot of um, bureaus have had to have their fo reporters focus on one of those two issues as like the big China stories of this year and haven't had time to devote to reporting on Tibet. Um, I know that I was in Beijing in October and one of my colleagues said that he does want to get back to Tibet and it, to reporting on Tibetan issues sometime this coming year. But he's been um, pulled into a lot of the Xinjiang coverage and so he hasn't had time to do that. If if the uh, if it's mostly a local government issue that they're trying to sort of keep you out, but they can't keep Xinhua out, you, is there any possibility that at some higher level in Beijing or something that you could put pressure on the central government to to allow you to get permission to travel in these areas, or they're they're happy not they're also happy not so it, in some sense it's more or less state policy. Right. right. I think on the Tibet issue, they're happy not to have Western reporters in those areas. Um, I have experienced other, you know, there have been other stories I reported on where the foreign ministry has asked, has tried to ask local officials to give me interviews in those areas, but it's never been on an ethnic minority issue or in those areas. Um, I think the opposite, in fact, I would say it's the opposite. The um, when I went and did the report on Larungar at the end of 2016, a few weeks later I was in Beijing and I went to a meeting at the foreign ministry that was on a separate topic. But in that meeting, the foreign ministry officials um, criticized my report on Larungar and they said that they had gotten complaints from Sichuan officials. So it's the other, in that case, it's like, it was local officials, provincial officials complaining to oh, the central government right. saying, oh, somehow this reporter managed to get in, didn't notify us, didn't ask for an official tour and did this report and then the foreign ministry was berating me for writing this. Even though it's not a requirement that right. you it's not ask a requirement. permission. They said that what I should have done, why didn't I go to the Sichuan, the Sichuan provincial government, they would have been happy to have set me up with a tour of Larungar and brought me there and, and sort of educated me on what was really going on there. Right. So, <laughs> right. yeah. So I think that in the, in the ethnic minority areas, it's actually probably generally the opposite of the dynamic where the central government does have this unstated policy, like not official policy of preventing Western reports from going out there and they expect the local government to reinforce it and the local government also expects the central um, government to, to sort of pressure reporters not to go there too. Right. I mean, when we were talking before the, this event, it, it seemed that I, I often tell my students, you know, that Tibet, uh, and you added Xinjiang as, as a kind of uh, extension of that, is the largest area of the world, geographically, that is blocked from reporting, right? Essentially a blackout zone on, on reporting. And, um, and it seemed like you, you felt that was the case, that, that that general statement that I've sort of said to my students may, may in fact be true. Right. I think when it comes to whether, you know, like the, a policy of countries, a central government country restricting foreign reporters based in that country from reporting on a region. Probably if you, like the Tibetan region is probably the largest area in the world where there's like this sort of unstated, um, stated in the case of t the TAR and unstated in the case of the other ethnic Tibetan regions, unstated uh, policy of preventing reporters from going there right. to report. And then you add in Xinjiang, which is one sixth of the Chinese landmass, so you've got one quarter and one sixth, like almost half of China is off limits to um, reporters in some way. Right. So in, in light of that, uh, um, you know, in some ways I, I would think that would m make reporters want to go there more, right? I mean, in the sense that I know that, that the hot spots of Xinjiang, the camps, um, the, the um, student demonstrations and, and so forth in Hong Kong are an intensive kind of uh, event and that that is part of what makes the news but there's also that kind of information gap in 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 the tibetan areas and i'm maybe probably part of the problem is you just can't overcome it um or i think you could over i mean i think you can't overcome it it takes a lot of planning it takes a lot of logistical planning it also is tricky in that you're thinking through like who you're putting at risk like what loco um, residents in those areas are putting at risk by doing this type of reporting. So when you go out there, for example, every time I've gone out to a Tibetan region, I almost invariably hire a driver to bring me around who's Tibetan. And so in several, at least one case, the driver was questioned by police. Like there was one case in 2009 where I went to Rebkong and then tried driving there to 
Nawa because there had been a self immolation. It was the very first self immolation taking place in Nawa. And I tried driving across the provincial line to, and then I was stopped at a checkpoint at night, and we were held. My colleagues and I were held in a police station overnight, um, and the driver was questioned by the police. So, uh, so I think reporters in Beijing are very cautious also about sort of like the risk that they're putting people at. So you have to think about, you know, whether that's like what kind, what the reporting payoff will be for running these risks, not just on yourself, but also for whoever's helping you. And, you know, you'll meet people in those areas who are very eager to help you because they want, they want to show reporters what's going on. They want the story to get out. But at the same time, there could be ramifications for them. And outside of that case, there was also another case where, um, you know, a Tibetan man, Tashi Wangchuk, appeared in an interview in a New York Times video, and later he was convicted for inciting, um, inciting separatism. Um, and the video was used as evidence against him in the trial. Um, he's from the Yushu area, and then he's in prison right now. So there are these instances where um, people who help you with reports are put at risk and you're trying to weigh that also. So I think that that's one, that's another point of leverage that the Chinese government and local officials use to try and dissuade reporters from doing these reports. So even if people are willing, as you've, you've said, he, he was willing to take that risk, but you don't want to be involved in right. <laughs> I mean, it puts letting us, people take those risks. Right. It puts us, I mean, that's a very tough case and I've thought a lot about the case of Tashi um, because what had happened was in 2015, he, Tashi is this like young man from um, Yushu who was very invested in trying to expand Tibetan language um, education in the area. And he was very angry at the local officials for not implementing like true bilingual language studies in the area. So he, what he wanted to do is he wanted to one, file a lawsuit against the local officials and two, um, go and talk to Xinhua, CCTV, and other official outlets in Beijing to get them to broadcast the story about his lawsuit and about the local officials. So he couldn't, he failed to file his lawsuit. He went, traveled to Beijing and couldn't get the, and showed up at the doorsteps of these official media organizations, but no one was interested in talking to him for obvious reasons. And I mean, it's a very sensitive, any ethnic minority issue is very sensitive. and. It's and no official outlet will do like a straightforward report on these issues. And so he was put in touch with our bureau, and our videographer decided to start following him around for a story about his efforts to um, get this policy changed, uh, like through these legal channels. And then um, we traveled to Yushu. I interviewed him for a print story um, that was on the wider issue of language education policy. And uh, and then two months after our video and the text story appeared, um, he was detained by police in his hometown and then put on trial later. And the video um, that my colleague did was used as evidence in the trial. And in the interview, I sat in on one of the video interviews, he said that um, he was asked by my colleague whether he wanted to have his face blacked out, his voice changed for the purposes of the video, and he said, and he emphatically said no because when obviously he'd been willing to be on media because he was trying to get his story in Xinhua and CCTV. The, um, and he said that, you know, all you Western reporters do is report on these issues, these ethnic minority issues, and always there's never a name attached to the Tibetans or the Uyghurs or whomever you quote. Like, and if there was someone who was there saying this on the record, it would be a lot more powerful. And he says he knew he was running a risk by doing this, but he was willing to go to prison if that's what it meant. Um, he had been detained briefly and put in prison twice earlier and used to be a monk um, and was fairly well educated. So I think our producer and editors decided it was, um, you know, it was fine to use him because he had state, he had said this emphatically. And, uh, you know, these are always ethical questions, but we don't know exactly what the consequences will be. And, um, and you know, they were, it turned out, to be very bad consequences for him, but he was he wanted to be on the record. And also, there is also this other th other thing that Western reporters have to deal with, especially in regards to ethnic minority issues, because those issues are never aired in the official media. And he was obviously trying to get them um, 
get the official media to report on them. And so there's a question of whether you're willing to give agency to this person or whether you're, in a way, you're taking away their agency and doing what Xinhua or these other organizations are doing if you're not willing to um, run with a story on this, even if they're willing to go on the record. Right. And it sounded like he was very clear that, I mean, he wasn't a splitist, right? He, he, right. he, he was just doing what the state law and the Constitution allowed. Right. right. There should be language autonomy and, and this kind of thing. So as you are when you're going to report in a place that isn't restricted, right? You're, yeah. you're abiding by state law and you're kind of giving a lie to the state you know, saying that it's allowing these things or allowing language autonomy and so forth by right. by acknowledging. <gasps> yeah, he was these very realities. careful to say that the only thing he was asking for was that the state abide by the local officials specifically abide by what was laid out in the constitution and um, about what was should be permitted and what should be done in these autonomous prefectures. Um, and he also even praised um, Xi Jinping and other central leaders for their leadership of China and was and he just said he wanted the local fish to, right. to abide by the law. Right. So you've got this local uh, central problem at, right. at every level. And and it's also another thing where like even then the center might not have his case might not have been it's unclear whether his case even ever got the attention of, you know, people that mattered in at the central government. I mean local officials were like very likely the ones who were being vindictive and wanted to um, go after him because he was very much emphasizing that they were in the wrong and that he was trying to bring this lawsuit against them. I wonder if it points to the fact, though, that, again, the center is allowing the local people not to, say, for instance, allow language autonomy, allow language teaching, right? I mean, it does, it does hold those, it holds the central government's feet to the fire on that, on that point. If, they're, if he raises it up, they right. have the core case. Do you, did you follow the reporting that was done in China on him? Was it strictly a kind of splittist, or did they raise the language issue? And the, they the never fact raised the language issue. There were some um, local reports, I believe, around the time. I was out of China by the time he was sentenced, so I'm not sure exactly how prevalent the reports are. I think that there were some local reports um, on the case, but they didn't raise the broader issues of language. Right. Right. Interesting. You've talked also about the importance of frontier regions to Chinese reporting and talked about how you travel to these frontier regions because it's there that the dynamic of power and resistance is most evident and you get a clear look at how China treats its most vulnerable citizens. Um, and I wonder, um, this was in 2000, not, not that long ago, 2018, China, the China Empire, Chinese Empire reborn. Um, is there some way that you can connect what's going on in Hong Kong and Tibet and Xinjiang? as frontier regions or? Well, I think that broadly speaking, they are, they are related. I mean, there's certain common elements. I mean, each of them has their very particular histories as, you know, being a historian, you know that, that it's always dangerous to try and like merge all these different regions into one holistic thing. But I do think that there are common issues that run through them. Language is one of them. I mean, the in each region there is this, like in language and culture in that there's a close affinity, you know, um, between the people of that, those regions and sort of a regional cultural language that's very strong and that's different than that of Beijing, for example, or that of most of northern China. Um, and in Hong Kong, you know, there's a whole province there, Guangdong province, that has that lang that uses that language. But Hong Kong obviously has a very different syst political, um, social, economic system because of the British colonial rule and what they and what they put in place and then the um, the semi-autonomy that came after 1997 so um, so I think that there are some common elements and I um, but also like differences between these regions I mean the Tibet uh, uh, Tibetan region is very different historically than say people always group Tibet and Xinjiang as like similar issues but of course they're very different and in Tibet, you had very different forms of rule, um, whether it's rule in local areas in Tibet or rule from Lhasa, the center, to other parts, to Amdo and Kham and other parts of Tibet. Whereas in the Uyghur areas of Xinjiang, there was never even like, there's never centralized rule in the same way that there was in Tibet throughout parts of Tibetan history. Um, or this like long tradition of uh, religious, um, rule and also patronage between 
the religious leaders in Tibet and say, for example, the Manchu rulers in Beijing and the Mongol <coughs> rulers in, um, in northern China. So I think that the histories are very different, um, even though on the surface it's all about, to a certain degree, about autonomy, cultural preservation, um, and, and sort of dissatisfaction with rule from Beijing, as well as dissatisfaction with uh, migration by ethnic Han to these areas. Um, throughout all three areas we're talking about, like there's migration by mainlanders to these areas, and that makes the locals feel very, very uncomfortable. And, um, and the idea that, that these migrants, whether they're you know, uh, sort of lower socioeconomic migrants coming from Sichuan province or wealthy business people, like they're taking away economic opportunities at every rung of the economic ladder from the local residents. Mm. Are the people in Hong Kong making these connect the demonstrators? Are they making connections to what's going on in Western China as a kind of concern for? I've seen interviews, um, and I've talked with some people where they have mentioned uh, what what is happening in some of the ethnic minority areas, and saying, especially with Xinjiang, because I think that's been in the news. Like the reports of the internment camps have been in the news a lot in the in the Western uh, news organizations, um, and they fear that these policies will be imposed at some later point in Hong Kong, especially after the 50 years is up, for example, and that, um, that there will be this forced dilution of their language and the way they, the sort of more uh, critical or independent way in which they think and any sort of um, unique cultural affinities that they have in Hong Kong. Like they, uh, obviously what's going on in Xinjiang right now is like an intense uh, program to try and uh, bring the Uyghurs in line with mainstream Han culture and really dilute the practice of Islam and the Uyghur language. And you see that happening in different forms in Tibet, but not sort of in the same internment camp system that they're using Xinjiang. And people in Hong Kong are very much aware of that from news reports. Yeah, and concern that it might happen to them. Yeah. Interesting. And a few years ago, there were these protests, even in Guangdong province, to, about Cantonese language. Like in Guangzhou, like this is maybe seven or eight years ago, I think, uh, there were protests in the streets of Guangzhou because the central government or the local, I can't remember which, where it originated, like either provincial government or central government wanted the local TV networks to have a greater percentage of the programming in Mandarin instead of Cantonese right. and a greater percentage of the newscast in Mandarin. And so there were actually people out in the streets protesting against, against this foreign language policy. For, foreign language. <laughs> right. <laughs> Being Mandarin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then we saw protests. Around the same time, there were protests in, in Amdo or Qinghai, like in right. various towns, which I'm sure some people in this room are aware of, that they were protesting against language policy that was being forced on schools there, which is partly what this guy, Tashi Wang Chang, who I met later, was concerned about. Yeah, it was almost a prequel to the Olympic uprisings, right? I mean, that, right. The, the, the concern that people had. So that, uh, the protests I'm thinking about took place right after the, like a few years after Olympic uprisings, okay. but in Amdo, I'm sure beforehand there were some protests yeah. related to that too. So this, I mean, going back to the the block, the the official block on the TAR and and the kind of unofficial block on those outside Tibetan regions outside of the uh, Tibetan Autonomous Region, do you can you think why there's such a difference? Does it make sense to you um, that there's that kind of difference, or is it is it just a the the convenience that you kind of have to fly into Lhasa? or that the provincial boundaries are easier to patrol because there's so few roads as opposed to the areas that abut Sichuan or uh, Gansu, or right. uh, wh what's going on with That's that? That's a good question. I haven't looked into the history of like why, of like that policy and journalists and why there is that split between those. Um, obviously, administratively, they're different. Like they're, the TR is a very separate administrative region from Sichuan or Qinghai. And, um, and you know, I think it's been, it was the center of, it was the Dalai Lama's seat of power Lhasa is there. Um, there's the history of the Dalai Lama is closely tied to Lhasa, and the Chinese government and the party see the Dalai Lama as a focal point for resistance to party policies regarding Tibet. So I think there's a lot of sensitivity around the fact that the that this was the seat of, um, you know, right before 1950, 1951, this was the seat of the Dalai Lama's power. Right. It's it's interesting. I mean, that you know, 
with with the 2000, 2008 uprisings, like so much of that dissent moved. I mean, in, in 1988, I think 87, 88, it was centered in Lhasa, and then in 2008, it was centered outside in those you know those other autonomous regions. Right. So it seems odd to focus on the TAR. Right. Yeah, and some people say that there's. Um, Right, a lot during 2008, a lot of the mo like it started off in the streets in Lhasa, and there was some violence there. But then there was like there was much more widespread, um, you know, destruction in other parts of the plateau, and not just in Lhasa. Yeah. Um, I I wonder if you can talk. I mean, you've been back in the states for a few years. You were at Harvard and, and at Princeton uh, teaching about. A reporting in Asia at Princeton? Teaching is that about ju yeah. journalism mm -hmm. in general. I mean, if you think about how Tibet fits in or falls out of the news cycles, what, what's the bigger picture that, that you see uh, Tibet sort of playing in, in the news cycle or in, in the media decisions to, to try to cover it? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. Uh, I think it's hard grappling with these issues when you're a journalist, because I think as you know, many there are many journalists who, um, especially when you're reporting abroad, you realize that there are these very unique sets of issues in these regions, and you want to report on them. You want to keep the issues in the spotlight, and you feel like they've been the issues have been marginalized or that they're not getting enough coverage. And then when you deal with editors back home, then you realize that the perspective is totally different. Um, that their focal point. Well, first of all. Um, getting editors outside of specialists in foreign news to focus on foreign news is very difficult. Like even now I work in the Washington Bureau and, they're, um, and the way that the lens through which they see f international news is entirely through U.S. policy. So like the, when I speak with editors there, the only thing they really, um, you know, that's imprinted on their mind about foreign news is like what the U.S. is doing about any given issue. So unless there's like an from that perspective, unless there's like an active policy regarding Tibet, for example, it's mar it's harder to sell that story to a certain set of editors. There are editors who spent, you know, international editors, especially ones who spend time abroad, who see the value in reporting on um, issues that are generally marginalized, and they feel that a place like the New York Times or the Washington Post or CNN or BBC or whatever, like that, this is a good venue to bring a spotlight to these. But they're competing also with. All the, with like the news of the moment, whether it's Iran firing missiles into the Persian Gulf or um, or an uprising in Hong Kong, like you're competing um, with limited re like with these other issues, and you have limited resources and there's limited space in the newspaper or on that night's broadcast. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the the main advocate for telling the stories of issues that generally aren't in the news cycle are the reporters and their personal <coughs> interests. So. I think there's actually a lot of, for, to a certain degree, among foreign reporters, especially, there's a lot, there's like a certain level of autonomy that those reporters have. So like if you're interested in a certain region, a certain issue, then you can really push that towards the desk. Um, I personally was very interested in Tibet because I had started spending time in Tibetan regions starting from um, 1990, starting from 99 or so, and almost every year, even when I was reporting New York, I made a trip to somewhere in the Himalay in the Himalayan region. So whether it was in um, Amdor Kham areas of Tibet, or in Nepal, or in northern in, in Ladakh in northern mm -hmm. India, um, or one time I managed to spend five weeks in central Tibet um, in around 2000 2001, went as a tourist. Like before I um, went to China to do reporting, I was able to backpack around there and pick up some knowledge of the area. So a lot of times, so like when I was in China, I was personally interested in these regions and would go out there. But, you know, other reporters might have an interest in, say, sort of China's health policy and not and veer away from that. I think that um, right now, given the depletion of resources among foreign bureaus in China, plus the big stories in Hong Kong and Xinjiang that some of that focus is turned away from Tibet because of that. I mean, there was one article that talked about, I think it was Ian Johnson in 2016, um, I think it was titled something, China working to keep foreign reporters on a short leash. 
and it said, quoting an anonymous journalist, that the news service Reuters had tightened its standards in a way that led to fewer news articles about human rights. Um, and there was a sense, too, that maybe, and, and I, I'm not even sure I got this right, but that maybe different parts of the paper were concerned about reporting on areas that the Chinese government didn't like. Is, there, is, is the New York Times dependent in any way? Um, or is it Reuters? Are they dependent in any way on the Chinese government or advertising in, the, in China that would make them sort of susceptible to pressure on, on fronts like that? Well, there is. Um, so we can go back to 2012. I, can, I mean, I can break down one case, one example of this. So in of the issues that you're talking about, which is um, 2012 when the Times came out with the big story on Prime Minister Wen Jiabao and the amount of money that his family had amassed through their relationships, um, like $3 billion or more in assets. And so at that time, we were starting up our Chinese language website in China. And that website is dependent on having large readership numbers to get advertising, especially luxury advertising, to make revenue right. off of the website. So um, it was key that the website remain unblocked in China in order to have those large readership numbers. But a few months after the website started, we ran the story on Wen Jiabao, and the Chinese government immediately blocked the web, this Chinese language website, as well as our English language website in China. And so the Chinese language website has since then struggled to make money, and the Chinese government has done everything it can to ensure that, China, that readers in China can't get access to it. At one point, for example, they had an app um, on the Apple App Store that China technically could not block. But what China did was ask Apple to take the app off of the App Store. Um, this was a year or two and ago. And Apple responded. And Apple responded, right. as Apple always does. Right. Um, and so the, um, so my point is that there are these financial relationships. China, aver China Daily um, gives our paper ec like some large amount of money to put in advertising in our newspaper. But it hasn't, you know, in my entire time there, has I haven't seen that business relationship influence our coverage at all. In fact, the Times has been willing to take these financial hits. Um, and they pu just published these papers on Xinjiang, which are very sensitive, and that the Chinese government has denounced um, us for publishing. And they, still, they have still gone ahead and done it. Um, I think, generally speaking, with some exceptions, the large news organizations are able to push back against these pressures to self-censor. Bloomberg is one exception, and, um, and that also was centered around reporting on a party leader around Xi Jinping and his family finances, and then they eventually decided to uh, self-censor some of the reporting on communist party leaders. But, um, but in general, I think the large news organizations have enough standing, enough resources to push back against this and, and risk the re repercussions. Um, mm -hmm. A Wall Street Journal reporter recently got kicked out of China because he co-wrote a story on, on a cousin of Xi Jinping. Um, but I think where reporters might be more wary is if they're like sort of freelance reporters that are in China, and maybe not they're on, even on a formal journalism visa, but you know maybe they have another job or they're doing something else, and they're writing on the side, and they're not going to go to the Tibetan region or to Xinjiang and try and report these stories. They're going to be writing, generally speaking, a lot of them are going to be writing softer stories, yeah, mm -hmm. because they're not even there on the, uh, use with the proper permits. Yeah, I see. Right. Huh. Interesting. Anything else you wanted to share with us as, as academics? I mean, you, you've been engaged with the academic community for a couple of years now. Um, things that we could do better to, to sort of interface with the media or? Um, well, I mean, I think I always rely on academic, I mean, especially because Tibet, I'm not a Tibet specialist. I don't speak the language. I, didn't do Tibetan studies or the history. So when I'm reporting on a region like that, I rely on talking with people like you for a lot of the context and the historical context. And you've been helped, like we, we um, when I had to, was in India, and I got into this Tibetan region that's hard to get into. I was doing a report on the sixth Dalai Lama and how he came from that region. You were very helpful in sort of, you know, calling me back and talking me through the history of that. And I think that we appreciate that type of context that academics can give us. Um.
Oh, the, and that brings up another thing, which is for a while, for a period, I was traveling to Dharamsala around once a year because that was how I could get, there comes to be a certain point where sometimes the reporting that you can do on regions is easier done by talking to people who have left that region. And so it right. ended up after 2008, 2009, when there were these uprisings and then crackdowns that it actually became easier to find people to recount what had taken place during, in those areas. And at places like Kirti Monastery, this place in um, Nala where there was an intense crackdown and some violence, like you had to travel to Dharamsala to interview people who had come from those regions in order to do the reporting on it. Um, and also there was also the internal story of the Tibetan government exile and the different policies they were debating about what to do about the Dalai Lama's middle way approach or, um, or sort of throwing themselves behind an independence movement. So there's like internal stories of uh, Tibetans in exile plus there are stories of what had hap just happened in those regions under Chinese control and so um, I found it helpful to travel to India to do these stories. In, in light of that, I mean I wonder if the Chinese, if you, in, in your perspective, whether the Chinese state is sort of losing an opportunity to, to let you go there and try to tell the story based there where they would have at least some more control or to you know have you going elsewhere you know to, to find people uh, who flee I mean are they making a mistake by blocking access I mean their narratives I get these kind of glossy magazines China's Tibet right. that, that shows how rosy things are mm -hmm. um, but is there is there a balanced narrative that might be found there if they would let people have more access? Um, I think definitely if they let journalists travel to those regions, but also if they provide it. And I think this is true in general, not just of the Tibetan regions, but in general China reporting, where if they let um, journalists interview officials more, whether they're in the center or in the local areas, then journalists would get at least a more, you know, a different side of policy making. They would get at least that their take, the officials take on why they're making this policy. It might be for security reasons, it might be because they, they believe that this policy is the best way to integrate two different cultures, but you would get that side of it, like the motivations behind right. and the intentions behind, policy, in, behind implementing certain policies. Like from the outside, a lot of times we look at these policies and we say, oh, from our perspective, it looks absurd or it looks like this policy would never work and why are they even doing this but there is an internal logic oftentimes there's an internal logic to this policy making that you you know we might or might not agree with it but it would be helpful for at least the, the narrative that the government's trying to push out for us to have access to people who would explain that to us right I, I think too about the reporting you did about the environment and that the new new river new Jiang, right right and uh, I think you know, at least the decision the government's made for now is one that the world would agree with, right? You, you sort of sensibly manage hydroelectric power in a way that's beneficial. Right. And there's a lot of environmental, you know, concerns on the Tibetan plateau that the maybe people would agree with the Chinese state's approach. Right. And and it would be interesting to have more exchange or reporting on that kind of thing. Right. I do think on issues like that, especially environmental issues, there is a lot of internal debate about like the new What the new decision, river. what the right decision right, is. What the right decision <laughs> is, and that, in, it, that, that also takes place, I think, on parts of the Tibetan Plateau. And we've seen, you know, them pull back on certain dam building projects on the Tibetan Plateau after there was an outcry from the local residents or protests um, or certain mining projects, for example. So I think that there is internal discussion, there is a give and take but very often reporters aren't allowed to see that. They're not allowed to see that discussion take place. So you come away with more of a you know, black and white picture, but that's not because we want that. That's not the picture we want to paint. We want to paint a story of um, you know, the actual process that's taking place, but we're not given access to that. The complexity, right? right. The Chinese kind of don't feel safe enough maybe to give, give people access to that. Right, right, Wait, yeah, and then and then the other question is like, once you do have access to it, whether the local officials with whom you're interviewing, whether they feel comfortable having their words be put out there on the record or not. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can open, open the floor up for questions. I saw a hand go up back there. <laughs> 
Um, so address the question about the news assistance first. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree with you that the um, news, the work done by news assistants, one is completely value. It's like the forms in oftentimes forms the backbone of the news reports that these bureaus do. Like it's absolutely essential and foundational to the reports. Um, the we've our preference is to be able to like hire the news assistants and have them work as full time reporters. Um, I don't. I personally don't like the system, the two tiered system of having Chinese. Uh, passport holders or nationals working purely as researchers. And, you know, for practical purposes, they're reporting also. Um, the, uh, they're doing what we do when we report, like doing interviews or trying to find people to interview. Um, and the Chinese government have, for many years now, has had the system where it says it's wrong, it's like illegal or against the regulations for. Chinese nationals to work for a news organization and be in a reporting role. They can only be working in a news assistant or a research role. So we're in kind of a, the news organizations are in kind of a bind in that we can't figure out how to legally allow the researchers to become full-fledged reporters and not have the foreign ministry and other agencies in the government sort of crack down on us and on the researchers for doing that. When I was in the Beijing Bureau, we did try to push the limits a bit by having the researchers write stories and having their bylines appear. And I think some, you know, when I look around at some reporting coming from China, that's still, some bureaus are still doing that. But I think that bureaus were lectured about that at some point, and so there's been less of that. And I think that's, I think that's a bad policy from the Chinese government. I think that we felt that we were able to have this um, unspoken thing where as long as the researchers weren't writing about very sensitive topics, the officials would let them get away with it. But I think they've been tightening up on that in recent years. Um, so I don't, for a Chinese national who wants to work for a foreign news organization based in China, I'm not, I don't see like an easy path for them to take. Like, it's very hard for me to see what path there is given the fact that there is this law or regulation in place that the government imposes and that they sometimes they enforce it loosely, but <coughs> oftentimes they, they're very tight about enforcing it. Um, the, a lot of, in, and that frustration that you expressed was felt by a lot of researchers in our bureau. And eventually, after a few years, what they did was they did took exactly the path that you've taken, which is then they went and applied for graduate school. And then during those programs have tried to think through whether they, what kind of career path they have in China or outside of China as journalists. And there's no easy answer to that. Um, I'm sure you and your friends have had lots of discussions about this. Um, in terms of the students, the sort of like more nationalistic expressions by Chinese students studying on campuses like Columbia, or as we've seen in Australia, for example, or other places. I don't really have a strong, I mean, I don't have a strong point of view on it. I haven't reported on that myself. I haven't gone to these protests and spoken to those students. I know some pe probably some people in this room have been to those protests or have been to the Joshua Wong one here at Columbia, and so they might have a better sense of um, you know, of the grievances and also have a better take on, on sort of whether, you know, there's, there's a debate or the discussion about how much of that comes from the authentic feelings of nationalism um, of these protests and how much of it is, is there is some level of prodding from, for example, Chinese officials um, that are working via, like from the consulate or the embassy in a country working in contact with the CSSA on a campus and sort of saying, oh, there's someone giving this talk on, there's this Uyghur activist giving this talk here, maybe you should show up there and, and make your feelings known about this. Um, there's, and there's been, ev there's been some evidence that there is this type of interaction, but it's unclear like, you know, how broad or how wide it is. 
Oh, I don't see it personally as my role to sort of catalyze sort of change in the, you know, like to move China in a certain direction. Um, I think that if, I think that, you know, there's Jonathan Spence, the Yale scholar, wrote this famous book called To Change China. I think that there's a lesson we can take from that, which is about Westerners who come to China and think that they can change society but end up failing. Um, the, the VPN question, a very, very small percentage of Chinese use VPNs, even among you know, the very well-educated or among the intellectuals. The, we discovered that because when our website, was, the Chinese website was blocked, like the traffic dropped tremendously, and only a very small percentage of the traffic that then came to came from mainland China, which means that there weren't very many people using, and the site was free, there was no like barrier to entry to the site. So, um, so I don't think very many Chinese are reading Western reports via VPN. Now there's certain, there have been certain ways that some Chinese have tried to get around that. Like for example, they would do screen captures of articles and circulate them on certain social media platforms. But then, you know, the censors find ways to block those also. So it's, um, I don't know what, not having, I spent a week in Beijing in October, but I haven't spent an extended period there since 2016. So I don't know what the latest is in terms of how strict the censorship rules are and what methods Chinese are able to use to get Western articles circulated on sensitive topics. Um, so uh, I think that when there is a large, a big topic like even the Wen Jiaval report with the, about his family, even though that was censored and our sites were blocked, that report was circulated widely among a lot of Chinese intellectuals. They found ways to sort of send that around to each other, whether it was through screenshots or other methods, but censors are always looking to try and subvert those. Um, on the latter question, there has been no change to access, as far as I can tell. Like there, the um, access to the TAR, the Central Tibet, is still very strictly re restricted in the same way that we talked about, where you have to go on government trip to go there. And then to the other regions, police are often trying to track down journalists when they're there and, and kick them out. Um, the Dalai Lama, I mean, this is a question that's on the mind of not only Tibetans, but also Chinese officials, like, because they're very cautious, I think, about what will happen um, and worried to a certain degree. Um, because the Dalai Lama, as we know, has been preaching this idea that this middle way idea where it, you're supposed to, Tibetans should exercise some restraint in what they're demanding of China, should generally practice nonviolence, and should advocate for a high degree of autonomy for Tibetan regions, but not independence. And I think that um, there's fear among Chinese officials, some Chinese officials who work on Tibet policy, that when he passes away, that, that those restraints that the Dalai Lama has placed ideologically on Tibetans will go away, and that there will be wide-scale protests on the plateau. There might be in a, a surge in violence, and it'll be much harder to control um, the areas. Um, the, and also, a lot of Tibetan activists who support the Dalai Lama have tried to make that case also. And because of that, they're, I mean, they're using that, that argument to try and press Beijing, to argue to Beijing, oh, you should be engaged in the Dalai Lama now while he's alive, and trying to meet his demands because he's the most reasonable interlocutor that you'll have with the Tibetans, and once he passes away, you won't have someone who is open to these compromises anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can address, I mean, so on both, in general, I think that there is, the way that Western reporters report on state violence and also on violence by, say, protesters. Like there's a, diff first of all, I think there's a difference in terms of intensity of violence by these sides. Um, oftentimes, I was in Hong Kong for three weeks this fall, and acts of violence that were attributed to protesters were oftentimes, uh, 
these singular acts of violence. Like, for example, there was a very horrific act was this man who was set on fire when he was arguing with protesters. And I think, and I heard from many protesters that they condemned that and that this was not something that anyone in the protest movement advocated. Um, and I think that if, you know, the police ended up catching whoever did that, then uh, even among many protesters in Hong Kong, they would be fine with that person being prosecuted for what they did. Um, the, and, um, and then also there was a protester who stabbed the police in the neck with a box cutter. And these things have circulated widely. But the thing with the police is that these are people who are part of the system who are trained in when to deploy violence and when to restrain themselves from violence. So I think that the reporting on the police is trying to look at whether they're following the rules of engagement and the training that they've been given or whether they're, um, they're going to the extreme in terms of deploying violence against, um, sometimes you're against not just protesters, but even by bystanders. Like there's many videos you also see of, oh, there's a bystander standing here, like a banker who's on his lunch break, and then he happens to be walking near the protest site and the police grab him and pepper spray him, for example. Um, and so I think that there's a different level of scrutiny of the police because they are these authorities who have, who are sanctioned by the state to deploy violence but, and, but because of that, then it's important that they, ha that they ascribe to their rules of engagement, their internal rules of engagement, and also ascribe to norms, by, norms expected of them by society. So I think that that's the sort of um, lens through which reporters and, uh, and other civilians are looking at police violence in Hong Kong, and also security force violence that's perpetrated in other parts of China. So like even if there's a, you know, in 2008, there was violence that took place on the Tibetan Plateau, and especially in Lhasa, where we saw some Tibetan protesters turn very violent and burn Chinese, sh like Han run ch shops, and several Han were killed um, in Lhasa. Uh, I don't think, from what I remember of the reporting then, the Western press did not shy away from reporting that. In fact, they were very. Um, it was in the Western media coverage. And I remember I was studying, when that happened, I was studying, um, doing sort of like a refresher course in Mandarin at, in, in Taiwan. And there was an American student there who was shocked by reading about these incidents of Tibetans carrying violence because he, his idea was like, oh, Tibetans are Buddhists and they should be nonviolent. Like, I can't imagine this is happening. He had no idea of the history of Tibet and of how, you know, like that Tibet is just like any other region that has had wars throughout their history and also engages in um, violence, whether it's by civilians or by the state at various times. And so the, um, and, he, and it was through the Western media that he learned about this violence and losses. So I don't think that the Western press tried to suppress these reports. In fact, they, um, they were very open about this reporting. And then, and then as the crackdown began across the plateau, then the lens changed and it was about whether the state violence that was taking place was, um, you know, was uh, was um, too much given um, what was happening. Like whether the state was deploying violence uh, to a greater degree than it should have been in these towns and cities and villages across the Tibetan plateau. Um, I haven't noticed, I haven't seen uh, Chinese officials commenting on that particular aspect of Trump's control of the press or his statements about press. What they have used is they've used the fake news phrase a lot. Like they've hmm. said, this is fake news or that's fake. They said, for example, the, there have been some officials, I think, who said that the Xinjiang files that were published by the New York Times and then and also by ICIJ were fake news. Mm -hmm. um, and they, what they do is they're using that Trumpian language to undermine, the, to try and undermine a sense of veracity in the news. I think that, um, that they uh, are deploying that. And it's not just China, it's many other governments in the world have started using that phrase. Um, the, there, there is a question about whether, there have been some reports that for example, that the Trump government, the Trump administration is not willing to help out journalists that might be um, under siege from, by, by other governments. And so I think that might embolden uh, 
other governments to sort of detain journalists or kick them out of a country. Um, sometimes you see the State Department speak out on press freedoms, but you never see the president speak out on that. So That hasn't happened in any reporting on Tibet, has it? It hasn't, as far as I can tell. No. So it wasn't a prison. I was held in a police, in like the back room of a police station. Um, this was in 2009. We'd come in at around midnight. Uh, several colleagues and I were in a car dri driven by Tibetan driver. We came across a checkpoint. Um, they stopped. These were paramilitary, sort of people's armed police, um, a paramilitary, and they stopped us. They, fa they looked at our passports, saw that we were journalists, and called the police, who then came and picked us up and brought us to the police station. So we spent the night there. Um, we were held in a back room uh, where we just sat in chairs. We weren't handcuffed to anything. I know, I do know that there have been one or two instances of reporters, foreign reporters, who have been like um, cuffed to an object in the room when held by police. But um, we were not, and they spent most of their time talking to a Tibetan driver, um, which is why I was using that as an example of the risk that you know local residents run when they work with us. Uh, we, during that time I was in this room, I called, I still had my cell phone, I called the for, my, our foreign ministry contact, told them that the police are holding us, and asked them to help put pressure on the local officials to get us out of this. Um, we were held overnight, and then the next morning we were brought to a, a larger city in a convoy of police vehicles where we were forced to meet a higher level police official there um, over lunch. And then we were driven to an airport a few hours away and forced, and we had to stay overnight in the hotel there with the police in the hotel, and then we were forced to get on a plane to fly out. So, the, I mean, the conditions in the police station are fairly, it's a very basic police station um, up on the Tibetan Plateau. It's not comfortable. There was um, wooden chairs that we sat on, but it wasn't, we weren't forcefully interrogated. Even our driver wasn't forcefully interrogated. They, I mean, in, he wasn't sort of like handcuffed to a table and beaten up in a room. They sat him down um, in an office space and asked him questions about what, what he was doing with us, you know, in a semi-threatening manner. And then they took away one of his official forms of ID and kept it um, as sort of leverage against him. Uh, but then he was let go, like he drove, after he dropped us off at the airport, he drove straight back to home in a different province, and he said he got home fine and had no problems. Sports reporter? Um, <laughs> so that was, I started off, I spent four years working in New York for the New York Times when I first started, and each year the editors asked me to take on different assignment. I think because I was one of the younger reporters on staff and they had these gaps that they needed to fill in coverage. So sports needed a general assignment reporter. I was on Metro doing the night shift on weekends at the time, which is probably the wor single worst shift <laughs> at the newspaper. But I was like the night report, night rewrite on weekends. And so they asked me to do sports and I saw that as an upgrade to what I was doing. And also I thought it'd be fun to do sports for a while. I'm not, I'm not immersed in the world of sports. I actually learned a lot about things I knew nothing about while I was doing sports reporting. But it, it, there was some great training in that, which is especially writing on deadline, because you're oftentimes covering these games and you're having to write stories and file them right in the evening when the print paper is on deadline. So it too, like it, I became a much faster writer um, <laughs> when doing these. And also, you had to be completely accurate with statistics and with these facts because sport, everyone's watching these games on TV. Like everyone knows what actually happened. You can't fudge any of this when you're a sports No fake news. Right, <laughs> exactly. <on> sports. <laughs> right. So, and then I was on there for a year and then they asked me to, do, to be a business reporter. So I went to business after a year on sports. Uh, how intimidating is that experience? And I mean, I, I, you've, you've written and, and we talked about your friend Gilles Sabrier, is that? Yeah, Sabrier. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that he was also sort of quickly deported from, from uh, uh, I think they were, in, they were just planning on filming some Tibetan dance or right. something. Um, right, right. 
So can you talk about the, the kind of impact that that kind of, I mean, it seems, although you're not handcuffed and just the intimidation factor, like how, how does that impact you? And it didn't seem to stop you from going back. Right, but it does, what it does, as I was saying, it does make you think about carefully through all the logistics and what you can get out of a trip. And so like you might not go back as often as you otherwise would. Mm -hmm. um, Gilles, so the last story that the Times did from Tibetan area was in February of 2018, and that was um, a colleague of mine, Stephen Lee Myers, who had just arrived in China, and Gilles Savoyer, who's a French photographer, with whom I've worked a lot with, and he and I have traveled a lot in Tibetan areas and Xinjiang, so he's very experienced at this, and he often travels with European reporters in these areas, too. Um, oftentimes, he brings me story ideas from these areas because he goes out there and then comes back. And so the, he and Stephen went to uh, Zongsar Monastery up in, um, you know, on the border of Sichuan and Qinghai, like no, very northern Sichuan. Um, and he, uh, they were, within 30 minutes of being at the monastery, they were, uh, the police found them and made them go to the police station register. But it wasn't just registration. Like in the story that Stephen wrote, it became apparent that the whole point was to kick them out of the area, even though there's no legal justification for kicking them out of the area. So they made them register, then interrogated them for hours in the police station. Then, similar to what happened to me in 2009, they escorted them on like an eight-hour drive or 10-hour drive to Chengdu and had them stay overnight there and then fly out the next day. So it's, um, and you know, since then, Stephen hasn't made a concerted effort to go back to these areas because right. I think he felt like he got really burned on that trip. Right. Um, I think Gilles has been Gilles has been to Xinjiang since then and has been to some other sensitive areas, but he also hasn't been back to Tibetan region. And this was, but again, partly the, both of them have been to Xinjiang since then. I think partly it's because the spotlight That's has been Xinjiang, yeah. right? So I think that. I, uh, knowing them personally, I know that they aim to get back to Tibetan regions at some point and keep reporting on them. And and when you're in the car with those that that maybe that second stage when you're being escorted to the airport, I mean, are they thugs? You know, do they feel like they're intimidating? Like it can be both. Like sometimes they can be. I've had experiences where they look very much like thugs. Like they're they're in plain clothes. They're wearing like le black leather jackets. Mm -hmm. They're um, they're burly. They don't, they're not wearing a uniform, um, and... Are they rough and talking with you? Yeah, or, or they're rough, and they're, they look like rough characters, yeah. um, and they're like six foot or whatever. Yeah. But then there, that was especially true of one instance in Xinjiang, um, and the, it looked like there were like ethnic Kazakhs, there. like they were like very big like people there. And, but then there's other times when it's just like they're in a police cruiser and they're uniformed and they're... Um, just kind of doing their jobs. Right, doing mm -hmm. their jobs, uh, so... There, that one time in Xinjiang when I ran into these like very large police officers in plain clothes, they even pulled, like their, their main thing was they just wanted to leave town. It was sort of like in these Western movies. It was like <laughs> in a Western movie where the sheriff, the coming to town, the sheriff just wants you to leave town because right. he thinks you're going to cause trouble. So he, they pulled our driver aside, our taxi driver aside and just kept asking, oh, when are they, do you know at wh when they're leaving? And they just kept following us around, never pulled us into the police station. But then... As soon as we drove on a bridge that um, took us outside of town, they stopped right at the border. Like, they stopped following us. So they right. just wanted mm -hmm. us to leave town. Interesting. Right, I did one in 2011, and usually they last for around five days or so, and they gather around two dozen journalists from Beijing and have them fly into Lhasa. Um, I think, I don't think you're able to have meaningful conversations with local residents, but I do think that you get a sense of the space and of the changes that are taking place in places like Lhasa or Shigatsa. Like they took us to Lhasa, they took us to Shigatsa, they took us up to this high tourist lake, um, Namso, and, and you do see uh, changes that are going on. Like, for example, on that trip, I did a story on the influx of Han migrants because you see them every, like, you, they can't, like, hide those. And, in fact, they're kind of, they kind of want to advertise that by saying, oh, there's economic opportunities coming to Tibet. There's tons of 
Han who were coming here to do to open up businesses. And so they brought us to like a factory that was Han run by a Han um, business, and you saw Sichuan shopkeepers throughout Lhasa or even on the shores of this lake in Nam. So, so there's certain um, stories you can do given even with that limited perspective. So I do think it's worthwhile for reporters. And, and most reporters I know who go on those trips, almost everyone I know, goes in like fairly clear-eyed about what the purpose of the trip is and what their what the trip aims to show them. And so like I don't think that um, there's a danger of reporters just spouting a propaganda line, but I think that they are trying to look at you know, different sides of the story based on what they see. Great, time for one more question. Uh, you mean the flight back to oh, Beijing? Oh, the flight, yeah, I had to pay for the flight, yeah. I mean, uh, we had to pay for a flight back to Beijing, but we didn't have to pay for the meal at the restaurant that we were forced to eat, I think. <laughs> or right. the night at the police station. <laughs> right, or the night at the police station, right? That was free lodging. So um, one thing I wanted to oh, get back to was the Dalai Lama question, which I meant to say this when you asked that I forgot, which is besides the idea of potential violence or mass protests on the plateau, there's this other issue, which is about who appoints the next Dalai Lama, or how the next Dalai Lama is chosen. I think that, that's actually as big an issue as anything else in, um, you know, among Tibetans and among Chinese officials, is that almost certainly they, Beijing will appoint some person that they will say is the Dalai Lama. And then others, maybe it'll be the Dalai Lama himself will designate a successor somehow, or, um, or there will be some sort of search committee that's formed in Dharamsala or among Tibetan religious leaders based elsewhere in the world, but there will be another Dalai Lama if there might be another Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama himself has said there might not be another one after him, but he's also said there could be another one. It could be any, he, this person could take any form. It could be a woman, it could be a uh, non Tibetan maybe, um, but there will be probably two competing narratives around who the Dalai Lama is. And this happened with the Panchen Lama, as, as many of you know. So, yeah, except they they've kept the, both <laughs> both parties and <laughs> under their control. Right. Right. So, can I ask a quick one? Okay, quick uh, question. Uh, I don't know. I haven't looked um, deep enough into that issue of like whether I think. Well, I mean on the sort of lowest level of the economic ladder, like the migrants who open up like dumpling stands in the streets of Lhasa. I don't think there are really subsidies for that type of migration. Um, generally, those people are willing to spend their own money to get to these places, just like they're willing to pay smugglers lots of money to get them to the U.S. to try and earn money here. Um, but I do think that when, st obviously, then there's a whole different category of state-owned enterprises coming into the plateau and doing work there, whether it's mining or uh, manufacturing or other things. And I think that's clearly obviously done with state money and they're bringing in people to live there and work there um, and changing the demographics of the region. Yeah, the Columbia, the Weatherhead Institute has published a book called The Disempowered Development of Tibet, where an, uh, an economist at, uh, based in the Netherlands has looked at that question a lot. And then a lot of, you know, Tibetan activists uh, disapproved of the railroad that was built from Xining up to Lhasa because they said that that was sort of a state plan to bring in more Han migrants. Um, so, you know, that was criticized by a lot of activists. But, you know, in any um, country, governments are constantly building infrastructure to connect different parts of the country. So I don't see it as like this nefarious plan to bring in migrants especially, but that they've been wanting to connect different parts of China um, the infrastructure for a long time. Sun Yat-sen had a very developed plan for putting train lines in Tibet all oh, the yeah, way back in the 19-teens, right. I think. So they finally realizing those. Right. Um, maybe uh, after after the, the talk, you'll have a chance. But I think uh, I just wanted to uh, thank Edward Wong for taking the time to come up and talk to us Thanks. from DC. and. Uh,
Hope, hope to see you again. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Great.